Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Because you are a believer, there are certain decisions that you must make. Your faith has strong and serious implications for the decisions, the actions that you take in order that you reflect the character of God in this world. That is the calling of every believer. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of 2 Corinthians and chapter 6. We began this chapter last week and we're going to complete it, God willing, now this week. And in the second half of chapter 6, we see that Paul is writing about a change, the change that should happen to every believer. And that is that we find ourselves constrained. We constrain ourselves not out of an obligation, but because who we are now. We are a different people. What was acceptable in our own eyes now are not. Because as we prayed a few minutes ago, we should have the mind of Messiah. His perspective is going to guide us and restrict us. And these restrictions are good. These restrictions bring joy into our life. These restrictions protect us from the deceit and the attacks of the enemy, that these attacks will not be successful over us, that we are not going to be a defeated people, but we are going to walk in his victory, doing his will and manifesting his glory. So Paul is speaking clearly to the Corinthians here, and notice how he begins. Chapter 6 and verse 11, and again I want to emphasize, we're going to follow the order, the word order that is in the text, the Greek text in order to see how things are, are put together. And when we see God's order for putting the scripture together, there will be a greater understanding of his message to us. And that's what we need to be doing every time that we encounter the word of God. We need to be praying that his message gets to us, that we understand this revelation for the sake of serving him, worshiping him, and doing what is pleasing to him. Now, these Corinthians, I mentioned that Corinth was a most ungodly place, full of licentiousness, all types of things that the word of God, the commandments of God, forbid. And now these Corinthians, both Jew and Gentile alike, they're finding that how they once lived, how they once thought, all of this is different. They are being constrained. But notice what, what Paul says to them in verse 11. Our mouth is opened up unto you, O Corinthians. Now, what does he mean when he says, our mouth is open unto Unto you, O Corinthians. This is an idiom of revelation. Paul is saying that he and others who serve alongside of him, who have come to Corinth to teach and be emissaries of the grace of God, that they have opened their mouth, that is, that they have shared with the Corinthians God's revelation. So we read, our mouth is opened 
unto you, O Corinthians. Our hearts have been enlarged. Now he speaks about hearts and he's speaking about endearment. That he has given revelation and this revelation comes from them to the Corinthians with great love. Their heart, heart, thought, but also affection. And he says, as we have given you revelation, as we have come to know you, as we have ministered in your midst, our hearts literally are expanding to you. So this heart change causes them to minister, to not just forget about them and move on to another people, but that this heart change has caused the Corinthians to be upon the thoughts of Paul, and this is why he is writing to them at this time. Look now to verse 12. Now, because of this love that was ministered through Paul and others to the Corinthians, mixed together with this revelation, the Corinthians have changed. This congregation is a group of people who now think and behave differently. That is normal. Everyone who has received the gospel, they are, as we saw in the previous chapter, a new creation. They are different. They are going to think differently, and that different way of thinking is going to impact how they behave. They are going to make different decisions and carry them out on a daily basis. And that's why he says, look at verse 12. You are not restrained or confined by us. Paul is saying it is not us, our ourselves, what we in our own natural being want that, that constrains you. This has nothing to do with our relationship, why you are being constrained. So he says, you are not constrained by us, but you are constrained by your, and it uses a word for a, a strong sense of, of compassion and mercy that is within the very essence of a person. Now, some Bibles, for example, if you look at the King James, it will use the term bow, meaning the pit of your stomach. Many times when we have strong feelings of, of love, when we are moved by compassion, we actually feel that in the pit of our stomach. And what he's saying here is, it is not us who constrains you. It's not for us. It's not because of who we are. You're not obligated to us in some way to behave in this way. The constraint that you're feeling it comes now because of this compassion that is functioning, behaving in your life. People are moved now to live differently, to think differently. And it's that love, that compassion, that mercy, this, this new way of perceiving things that becomes a source of constraint or restriction. What he's saying is this, perhaps previously you saw someone in need and you just passed by them. You may not be, be moved with care, concern. You may not have love for them. You might say, well, they're in that position because of their own making, because of their own foolishness, their own sin, their own decisions. That may be true, but now you just can't brush that aside. You can't just set that away from you, but you are moved. And we see in the Gospels many times this phrase, same word in a different form, where it says that Messiah was moved by compassion and it caused him to minister. So he's saying these feelings and actions that you are having it's not us who mandate you to do this, 
but it's your new being. It's your new nature. It is because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So he says, it is not us who constrain you, but you are being constrained by your, your own compassion, those feelings of mercy that, that you have. Verse, verse 13. Now, there's a word here, and it's the primary thought in this next verse, verse 13. And it's a word for, word for a, a payment. Some Bibles, Old English might say recompense. What it is, is a payment that is a natural outcome, the consequence of something. And what he's saying here, and let's just read the verse, verse 13. But the same payment as children I speak. Now, what does he mean by for as children I speak? Well, we know the, the old adage, like father, like son. So there's going to be a consistency from within a family. That father is going to influence his children to behave in a similar way. So like father, like son. And what Paul is saying here is there's a response, an outcome, a payment. When you've received the gospel, when you have taken hold of the revelation that we shared with you, the truth from God, that truth caused an outcome. There was a response from it. What was that response? These feelings of mercy, compassion, concern, care for others that, that you cannot uh, be set aside but compel you to get involved in the life of others to take concern, not to be like Cain, who says, am I my brother's keeper? I'm not obligated to him. I'm not his keeper. But the implication is, yes, you are. That you need to be someone who's concerned for the well-being of others. And this new nature will, will manifest a sense of compassion, concern to do something. And what Paul is saying here is that this is the natural outcome, the recompense, what every believer has. And this is why he says, I speak to you as children because we're the ones who, who gave birth to you, spiritually speaking. As we are, so are you. It's not that we're obligating, but... This is your new nature, your new status. And therefore, he says, and you have been enlarged, also you. What's been enlarged? This capacity to love. Their concern has grown. They are seeing that they are getting involved in a more and more. And this word is a word for expanding. So you yourselves are being expanded in how you act, what you get involved in, the people that you are concerned about. So there's something expanding, growing in these people. And it's this capacity to love and to show compassion for others to be concerned about them. Now, move on to verse verse 14. Here we have Paul responding about another implication of this new nature, that we are a new creation. And that means in the same way that compassion moves us to get involved with people, the holiness of God, our call, our covenantal relationship with him can also mean that we won't have something to do with someone else, that we will separate ourselves, that we will not be involved with them. So we need to always, and this is a very simple principle, but oftentimes ignored, it is appropriate 
to get involved in someone's life for the purpose of ministry, leading them to salvation, being a blessing, a help unto them, counseling them, steering them in the truth of God. That is always appropriate activity for others, to be involved in others' lives. But in that same way, that same faith, that same new nature, that same objective that we have to serve God can also manifest itself in us separating, distancing, not being involved with others. And that's what Paul is going to begin to talk about in the next few verses. Look at verse 14. He says, and it's a commandment, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, he does not have a context for this, which means simply it's broad. Do not be unequally yoked. And this word yoke implies being put together in some type of objective, some type of purpose, some type of contract, some type of agreement. So we should not, and here are some simple applications for this. A believer must not, it is forbidden for a believer to marry an unbeliever. Just that simple. Secondly, to go into business with an unbeliever, one ought not do that. That is going to have some disastrous results. So there are clear walls of separation that we do not want to break down. We want to build them up thick. So there is a clear separation difference between us and them. And therefore, he says, look again, verse 14. He says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers and now he's going to give us some simple understanding of that he writes for what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness now these two words and i just want to pause for a moment to speak about the significance of these two words righteousness is a kingdom word. I frequently mention, seek first the kingdom and its righteousness. So the kingdom, one of the chief adjectives that describes the kingdom of God and the kingdom people, our behavior, how we think and behave, is righteousness. And what's in conflict with righteousness? Now, there is a connection between not only the kingdom and righteousness, but the law and righteousness. And this is what we need to understand about this. And you're going to see this clearly if you study the book of Romans. The law is not an instrument that produces righteousness, meaning this. I can't take the law and apply it to my life, and become righteous. The law does not have any power. It was not given to be an instrument for righteousness. But it's connected to righteousness. How? The law defines what is righteous and what is unrighteous. So we see here Paul saying, don't be unequally yoked with non-believers, with those who are against the faith. And then he gives an example. What partnership can can those who are righteous have with those who are about lawlessness? And that word lawlessness, and unfortunately, many Bibles translate it differently, but it's simply the word nomos for law or Torah, with that prefix alpha in front of which, which is a negation. So it's not of the law, for the law, but rather against the law. And we translate it lawlessness. 
Now, this has some very practical implications, simply this. You are either going to be moving in righteousness or living in lawlessness. There's no position in between. They are not, are not linked together. They are mutually exclusive. So this is why he gives this example. And he writes, for, for what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? Verse, verse 14, the second part. And what fellowship does light have with darkness? Again, they are mutually exclusive. Where there is light, darkness flees. If there's darkness, there is no light. So he's using simple illustrations to make his point about, and it's a commandment, do not be, you must not be, yoked unequally with non-believers. Now verse 15. For what, and it uses a word for the Greek word voice, or speaking, or word, and the prefix for together. And we would translate it harmony, perhaps. So he simply asks, and he uses two different terms that are clearly in conflict with one another. Look again at verse 15. He says, for what harmony does, does Christ, the Messiah, have with, and he uses an Old Testament term in the Torah, this term, Bali Yael. What is that? It speaks about that which is evil through and through. So very important that we see this. Bali Yael. It has to do with that which is evil consistently, thoroughly, wanting nothing to do with the purpose of God. So we see how Messiah, he's the anointed one and he's committed to the purposes of God. But this term, which oftentimes is found in the plural, speaking about evil men, evil women, those who are in opposition to the purposes of God. So Messiah is about the purposes of God and this term Beli Yael is against. Second part of verse 15. Or what portion does believers have with unbelievers? Meaning we have no part. What we're going to receive and what they're going to receive has nothing in common. We're going to receive the blessings of God, the promises of God. And they're going to receive the judgment, the curses of God. So exactly opposite. This is how we need to see these individuals that are linked to this world rather than the kingdom of God. We can have no fellowship, no relationship, no agreement. There's not going to be harmony between us and them. Verse 16. And what, and he gives a word for, for setting down together, meaning putting something together with. Now, we might just simply understand this as an agreement. Look again at the text, verse 16. And what agreement can the temple of God have with idolatry? They are by nature opposed to one another, categorically in opposition. The worship of God and idolatry. The worship of God is, is incumbent upon a person, and it manifests submiss submissiveness. It manifests a person in obedience. But idolatry, is all about that person exalting self and getting what they want to give and doing so in what they believe is a culturally acceptable manner. Oh, I, I'm not unreligious. 
I'm not ungodly, but this is what my God wants me to do. This is how I serve my God. And of course, these idols, they don't speak, but we hear exactly what we want them to say. This is a problem. So he says, idolatry and the the temple of God, they are in categorically conflict with one another. Look now to, to verse 16, the second part. For you are the temple of the living God. Now, he's emphasizing, and he's going to get more specific. You are the temple, meaning the Spirit of God. God has entered into us. This is what we've seen in the reading from Leviticus as we began our time of worship today, where it says, I will set my tabernacle in your midst. Do you realize that that is a kingdom expression? If you look, for example, in in the section in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21 and 22, we see that. We see the same term, I will be your God and you will be my people. We see God promising to put his tabernacle in the midst of the people. All of this is an outcome, and I hope you know the answer, an outcome of redemption. So he's moving here and he says, because of our redemption, we think differently, we behave differently, we enter into certain relationships, and we forbid other relationships. Look again at verse 16. He says, for you are the temple of the living God. Just as God has said, and now we're seeing that he's quoting from Leviticus 26. And by the way, this is also a a hint of the same scripture appears in Ezekiel chapter 37 with God bringing about a kingdom reality to the people, fulfilling his purposes and Messiah coming and establishing that kingdom. So we read here verse, verse 16 where he says, and God has spoken that I will dwell among you and I will walk. Now, most because this is what we read from Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 12, and I will walk, the rabbis understand this as a term of not just intimacy with God, but, but fellowship. It is about experiencing God. And here's the takeaway for us. It is when we say no to certain things in the world that that rejection brings about intimacy, brings about fellowship with God. So he says, I will dwell among them and I will walk. And then we have that that definition of redemption. He says in the verse, verse 16, and I will be to them God, and they will be to me a people. And the implication is, a people unto me, my people. Now again, this expression from the position of Judaism and what we see supported in the new covenant as well, it all relates to redemption. Redemption changes us. Redemption compels us, not out of an obligation, but out of who we are. Many times people will say, well, that's just not who I am. I wouldn't do that. That's not how I think. That's not how I behave. That is not according to who I am, my nature. And the same thing is being said here. Because of our new nature that came about through redemption, because through redemption we are brought into the family of God, because we are, and what's interesting, is that there's going to be a nuance in the scripture. Because what we see usually in the scripture, where this definition of redemption appears, 
is like we read in Leviticus. And, and I will be your God and you will be my people. What's interesting, when we, we see it in the new covenant in the book of Revelation, there's a change. He switches people and he turns it into sons. Why? Is this to, to neglect women, avoid, set apart? Absolutely not. When he talks about sons, he's using this in the concept of heir, that we through redemption become heirs. We have an inheritance. That's what he's saying. And therefore, he says this in the book of Revelation to tell us what our inheritance is. It is the kingdom of God. So look again. He says, And I will be their God, and they will be for me a people. And in, in an implication of that, an outcome of that, the result of that, now look at verse 17. Because of this new relation, because of redemption, which is a kingdom concept, notice the implication for us. He says, therefore, that means in light of this, because of this, as an outcome of this, therefore, you come out of the midst of them. Don't be yoked or connected to this world. We have a calling out. And by the way, this word, the word to, to come, and the word out, to come out, this is the same concept of the exodus, to go forth from. Remember what we read in Leviticus chapter 26, that last part? It is the first half of verse 13 where God says, I am the Lord, your God. Notice this relationship, your God. And I have brought you out of the land of Egypt. This bringing out, this departure. So this departure has consequences. There are outcomes from departing with God. Departing with God, walking with him means... Notice what he says. Therefore, you come out from the midst of them. And he says, and you, and it might be, you be separate. But literally, if we pay a good amount of attention to this word, it's a word for setting boundaries. This is such an important concept. We need to be people that set boundaries in our life. I don't pass this boundary. I do not do this. I do not say that. I do not participate in that. And those boundaries are based upon God's standards. What standards? The standards of the Torah. Let me just say for a moment that there is a false teaching that has plagued Christianity for centuries and that is that as believers the law no longer has relevance the scripture makes it very clear we're not under the law what's one way to understand that we are not going to be judged by the law but the law still has relevance messiah says Until heaven and earth depart, will it depart? Yes, it will. When will it? During the millennial kingdom? Absolutely not. When he speaks about a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, that is only after the millennial kingdom. So the law has relevance now. It is not in effect. There's no temple. There's other reasons, but we can still utilize the law. We cannot keep the law in the fullness of what the Torah says. But we can take the truth. As Paul says, the spirit, not the letter, but the spirit of the law. And when we walk not in the flesh, but in the spirit, we will fulfill the righteousness 
of the law, Romans 8, 4. So here we utilize, how do we utilize the Torah? By seeing its definition of righteousness. This is us. This is what we embrace. This is what we're involved in. This is how we behave. And those things that the Torah says are unrighteous, this is where we set the boundaries, where we do not participate because we want to demonstrate righteousness and be separate from unrighteousness. This is the implication of what he's saying in this passage when he says, let's go back to verse 17 at the beginning. He writes, therefore, you come out from the midst of them and you be separated. Literally, you set boundaries. You set set these markings that you don't participate, that you don't take part in, says the Lord. It's a commandment. It's godly instruction. And, and he uses the word for that which is of impurity, that which is not clean. Takes the word for cleanse, cleaning, and it puts a prefix which is unclean. That which has not been perfected or made pure. So those things that are unclean, he says, do not touch. And this word, do not touch, is a broad word in the biblical language. When we say, I'm not even going to touch that. I'm not going to speak about it. I don't want to think about it. I'm not going to deal with it. It is going to be something that I am not uh, related to. And that's what he means when he says, do not touch. It implies not thinking, not having any connection whatsoever with that. So anything that's unclean, and remember what we've learned, I, I've said this several times before, but this word for, for unclean, is that which is unacceptable that God will not bless. So when I choose and I am connected with that which is unclean, what I'm doing is I'm pushing away God's blessings. But when I am connected to, participating with part of that which is clean, that which is pure, that which reflects to the character and purpose of God, then I am inviting God's presence, inviting his blessing. So he says, come out, and this term come out is really related to the call to depart from this world. And it's that term which really to be called out. He says here, come out, but this phrase to be called out, ecclesia, is what the word church literally means. Once more, and that which is unclean, do not touch. And I will receive you. Now, again, this term receiving, it's a term of welcoming something, receiving something with joy. So he says, I will receive you when we say no to something. It's an invitation for God's presence and not just his presence, but his provision and not just his provision, but his perspective and not just his perspective, but his power. All these things come when we say no. Now, I want to speak about a word, the word Natsrut. Now, Natsrut is simply the Hebrew word for Christianity. And it comes from a word, Nun, Sade, Resh. We know this word, Netzer, which is a, a sprout, a twig, as Messiah is called, the, the sprout, that twig that comes from the stump of Jesse. But, but in the verbal form, this word, is a synonym for the word to keep or guard. So we use the term Shomer Shabbat, keeper of the Sabbath. Shomer Mitzvot, the keeper of the commandments. It's a word of of observing, a word of guarding. And what it says here is this, 
that we're supposed to guard ourselves, that we're supposed to keep ourselves pure and keep ourselves away from those things that, that are displeasing, those things that God rejects himself. When we do that, we are inviting the presence, power, perspective of God into our life. Look now to our last verse, verse 18. Now, verse 18 has an exciting change. We see, we might say, some political correctness in the word of God because he says, and I will be to you for a father. Now again, father provider. Father is an instructor. All these good things that a godly father will do, he's promising to do that to us. So he says, and I will be to you for a father, and you will be to me for sons, and he says, sons and daughters. And what that is speaking of, you ask, why? We understand people simply speaking about a covenant people. I will be their God and they will be my people. Understand this, a covenant people. When he changes it in the book of Revelation, as I discuss, and it says, I will be your God and you will be my son, we have an inheritance. But when he speaks about you will be my sons and daughters, what's he speaking about? He's speaking about a family relationship. And family speaks about this intimacy that God, when we do this, we're going to experience his intimacy, his presence in our life as we discuss. So he is going to make us his sons and daughters, says the Lord. And notice the last word in the Greek text, the Lord, and normally it's translated, the Lord Almighty. It is a word that speaks of his dominion over all things, that he is a possessor of all things, and that his possessing goes back to the very origin of this creation, that everything belongs to God. So it's a name, a title that 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 emphasizes and exalts God as the God of all, meaning of all things. He is the sovereign God, and he's making us promise that we will be his family, sons and daughters, and he will deal with us as a father, a godly, glorious, heavenly father. He will deal with us. Is there anything better than that? Well, we'll close with that until next week. May God richly bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.